Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. So I'm back here with Dr. Ned Palmer, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for Panacea Financial, who is generously supporting our Health System Science series. Today, we're discussing uh, another question, and this one is PRN loans, credit building opportunities. What's the deal with that in meds, uh, med students and Panacea? Thanks so much, Patrick. Super excited to be back. Uh, really excited uh, to be partnered with Inside the Boards in this the HSS series that you're running. Um, now, PRN loans are, I think everybody knows what the terminology <laughs> indicates right off the bat, but really the, the goal with PRN loans is to get medical trainees money as they need it. Uh, too many times you don't have access to capital, you're being charged ridiculous rates for it, you have to ask your parents for a co-signer, all these things that add to your financial stress. Embarrassing. It's embarrassing, and it, it hurts, and it's stressful, and it's shameful, and we didn't want any of that. We wanted to build the best possible product that we could and treat you like the adult professionals that you are instead of making you go ask your dad to co-sign. Yeah, I like that. Um, I always tell the med students, I'm like, remember, you're adults. You have value. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, uh, you know, your time is, is worth something. You're a human being. So, you know, don't put up with, uh, you know, BS or uh, letting people push you around. Man, medical hierarchy is a bigger topic. It is, but you've, as a med student, you worked hard to get here. You worked incredibly hard to get here, and you should be rewarded for it instead of punished for it or penalized for it. So that's really where we've tried to build a lot of these. For all the adults out there listening, to learn how Panacea can help you with your financial life as an adult, go to panaceafinancial.com slash ITB. Panacea Financial, a division of Sona Bank member FDIC. So welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast. I'm Patrick Beeman. I am your usual host. I just, to remind the audience, am a doctor who did his undergraduate medical education at the University of Toledo College of Medicine. Um, I did my residency in uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Wright State University in OBGYN. And we are diving in today to our health system science series, which has been brought to you by Elsevier and the American Medical Association who've provided content support and participants. And today we have Dr. Stephanie Mann, who is the Associate Dean for Clinical Undergraduate Medical Education at my alma mater and fourth year medical student, Angela Jacob. So welcome to the both of you. Thank you for taking the time to kind of talk to us about a little bit of what HSS is, this third pillar of medical education, um, and to provide some overview and a little bit of practical application in terms of a project you guys work together on in the wake of COVID. It's a lot to say, um, but let's start with uh, Angela, you're the most important person in this podcast because you are the stand-in for what our audience is. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm sure you're more than just a fourth-year medical student. Hi, so my name is Angela Jacob. I go by Angie, so Angie's fine. So as Dr. Beeman mentioned, I'm a fourth-year medical student at UTCOM. I am currently applying to physical medicine and rehabilitation, doing interviews for that. Um, but I was born and raised in Toledo. I love it here. Do you like your time at uh, Utcom? I do. I love it here. Um, I feel like I've been prepared very well, and we've got great faculty and great students, and um, just an all-around great experience. I agree. Um, is uh, so. This being my alma mater, um, I remember very fondly uh, neurology's uh, Dr. Imran Ali and uh, Dr. Elmer. Um, it's one of the best rotations I had in the fourth year. Um, and Dr. Grubb in cardiology, have you, do they, are they still around teaching? They are still around. I have not rotated with Dr. Elmer nor with Dr. Grubb, but uh, I have with Dr. Ali and he's, he's amazing. Yeah, agreed. So. And uh, Dr. Mann, you are also an OBGYN, MFM. 
specifically, how long have you been at uh, UT? So I arrived in April of 2019, so it's been about a year and a half. Okay. And, and actually, uh, I succeeded Dr. Ali, and he had been the associate dean for clinical undergraduate medical education, so I had big shoes to fill. Um, but that's what I've been doing for the past year and a half. And I, I divide my time between those responsibilities and then also uh, being a clinician as well, taking care of women with high-risk pregnancies. Awesome. Great. Well, uh, thank you for the time. Uh, what did you do before uh, this post in uh, the deanship there? Yeah, so I was um, in the GME uh, world. I was program director for an OBGYN residency at University of Vermont, College of Medicine. Okay. And I just, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, today we're here to talk a little bit about health system science. And in fact, no pressure, but this will be the possibly the first we post in our six-part series on this. But no pressure. So today we're going to discuss health systems uh, processes. Is that a, a kind of good summary of our goals in broad strokes? Yes, definitely. Perfect. Well, Angie, you and uh, uh, Dr. Mann worked on a project, and it was that project which came to the attention of uh, Dr. Hamoud, who has been helping coordinate this for the AMA. Can you tell us a little bit about that project or um, even just what you would like to open with in terms of starting our conversation? Sure. So... In March, as medical students, we were pulled from our clinical rotations for obvious safety reasons due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, a lot of us felt pretty helpless staying at home while the residents and attendings that we were working with just the week before were working longer hours under very difficult circumstances while potentially neglecting their basic responsibilities at home, like taking care of pets, buying groceries, um, since children were also being removed from their academic environments at that time, there was the added burden on the healthcare workers of childcare. So UTCOM Cares began with a simple text message that I sent in our M4 class group chat asking if anyone would be interested in volunteering to provide childcare for the residents and attending physicians. Um, unsurprisingly, a ton of people came forward um, and they were interested. I did not expect, however, the number of ideas that would be introduced in response to that text message. So that ultimately encouraged us to think about how other populations in our community would be impacted by COVID-19. Um, so from those initial discussions, UTCOM Cares engaged in initiatives that provided much needed services to our pediatric and geriatric populations. Those populations became disconnected, of course, during the pandemic from our healthcare resources. Throughout the development of our project, we started to see how health system science thinking played a major role in the organization of our outreach efforts. So with a focus on our community, our group's goal was to determine the needs of these different populations of patients within our community and to connect them with resources that they could not, not access because of the pandemic. Makes sense. Yeah. So in retrospect, we employed a systems thinking approach that was grounded in the IHI quadruple aim framework. Okay. And so we used that to determine how we could best provide those resources to um, our communities at risk populations. Gotcha. So Dr. Mann, can you give us an idea of, I mean, we hear this all the time, uh, systems thinking. What is systems thinking? And then can one of you kind of provide a framework to help us understand the IHI's quadruple aim? Sure, I'm happy to start. So, so when you contemplate what systems thinking is, this is really looking at the different components that make up any system in which we function. Of course, here we're talking about healthcare and figuring out how the, the different components interrelate and connect. And then I always look at it as trying to uh, facilitate connecting those dots because a lot of times we have resources that are available, we have patient populations we ha that are in need in the community, but they're not always connected. And that was one of the uh, what I really was so impressed with in terms of the work that Angie and uh, and her colleagues did was really figuring out 
you know, the populations in need, looking at resources that were available, but then bringing them together. Because as you can imagine, when we we're faced with a pandemic, you know, a global pandemic or any kind of uh, crisis that impacts people's access, right? A community's access to needed resources. The challenge is always, how do we connect those? And how do we connect those needs? And so when we think about, when you take a step back and look at systems thinking, it's really trying to understand what is available and how do we get people who need resources the most access to those resources in the most uh, efficient, expeditious, uh, and highest quality way. Gotcha. So how does all of this then apply to patient care? Like, I, I mean, I understand that the aim is to think about the broader context in which the, you know, clinical encounter occurs between doctor and patient uh, when the door shuts in the exam room. Um, but a better way to ask it would be, why is this important for undergraduate medical education? So I think it's important to kind of have this infrastructure because it it sets up this organized system with these very clear objectives and um, goals within that system. And then when everything is kind of working in harmony, it creates this environment where patient care is at the core and, you know, the best patient care is able to be provided because all these other aspects of the infrastructure are kind of in line and functioning um, as best as they can. To follow up on that, I think you know, Patrick, you ask a, a really good question. Why should we even consider this as part of undergraduate medical education? And I think what what the health system science really does is it it's I look at it as the is the glue in the bridge between the basic sciences and clinical and the clinical curriculum. You know, for the past at least uh, thirty years, we much of our thinking has been siloed. And it, you think about the Flexner approach to medical education: first two years are your basic sciences, you know, second two years are or your clinical education. And I think what's been missing, and of course, what has been going on now for about the past 10 years is figuring out how to integrate those two, because we don't learn in silos, nor do we practice in silos. And that's what health system science does. It really introduces the idea that not only do we have to learn about how all the different organs of the body are related, how how the different systems inter interface, but we have to do that when we take care of patients as well. And one of the one of the examples that I always think of is that you know, as somebody who takes care of women with high risk pregnancies, I could be the best obstetrician in the world, and I could say, yes, I've diagnosed your diabetes. Here's the insulin that you need for your blood sugars. But if that patient cannot get to my office for her appointment, cannot get to the pharmacy to fill her insulin, or doesn't even understand the importance of insulin, if I don't if I don't look at her, at the patient's world, and understand what factors impact her health and her ability to access our healthcare system, both before she comes to our office or to our labor and delivery unit, and after she leaves, then we're not providing the best possible care. We are just, again, it would be very silo just to say, okay, here's what we need to do for your blood sugars, and not think about the context in which she lives in a, in a parallel fashion, thinking about the context in which we practice and how best to connect patient with resources that are going to help provide her the highest quality care. Yeah, and I, I love that because in the thing I like to say a lot is that what separates us as physicians over pure scientists is is exactly this. We we don't just do applied biology. Uh, we are practicing an art that uses science. We're not scientists, properly speaking. Um, and, and because of that, the interest now that we have growing with reference to some of the topics and the systematization of health system science is, is pretty exciting for my part. Um, and my background's in philosophy. Uh, that's uh, somehow I made my way to medicine. But uh, this is the sort of stuff that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people think of as afterthought or, but it's really the, the primary kind of thing. It is the, the uh, motion that connects all of uh, the other stuff we do. So, um, yeah, it's a good perspective. 
So I guess before we move forward, I, I forgot to mention to you, to you both, what we usually do within this podcast is, is make sure that we cover some sort of uh, question-based uh, uh, application of knowledge that possibly could show up on some standardized exam like the USMLE or mm -hmm. the up-and-coming health system science examination mm -hmm. uh, that, that may be required here by many medical schools as the, the years go on. But uh, to look in broad overview for the rest of the session today, we've got some learning objectives, and then we're going to um, move from this kind of general discussion to the particularities of the uh, systems-based thinking and healthcare processes within the context of discussing some cases from Elsevier's HSS review book. Uh, so do you want to talk, either of you, about uh, our learning objectives today, and then we can just kind of dive into some of the cases? So I think, yeah, just to, to follow up on what you said, Patrick, the, the cases that we're going to discuss during this session will cover that core domain of health system science that really talks about healthcare structure and processes, and then how to apply systems thinking, which we had talked about is really the domain that links the different uh, concepts of health system science. So we're gonna focus on different components of the quadruple aim and really emphasize the importance of understanding how healthcare systems are structured within the, kind of within the context of a quadruple aim framework. So we're gonna think about the, the explicit learning objectives that we hope uh, your listeners will take away. Uh, we will think about the following. One, uh, we'd like to make sure that everybody's able to explain the difference between the triple aim and the quadruple aim, uh, that your listeners can really have a concrete definition for systems thinking. Uh, they can explain the importance of systems thinking to patient care, uh, define the uh, Donabedian model of care quality, and then talk about really how provider burnout is, is related to healthcare outcomes. I love that, especially the last point. Uh, yes, uh, throughout yes. Our, throughout our platform, I've I've also made it the point to to really encourage students to prioritize not only their uh, life, but um, to prioritize things that can affect their ability to be a consummate professional. Um, and one of those things is mental health. Uh, one of those things is, you know, the sense of burnout and this loss of idealism that uh, drives me nuts. And it seems that to some degree gets trained out of us throughout the, you know, cycle of medical education. And it's, it's, which is so sad. It's so sad. It really, really is. Yeah. It's a tragedy. I mean, I mean, it really is. Yeah. Like the recent data about, a, you know, attendings, at least half of them meet criteria uh, for burnout. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. But yes, let's move on. All right. So this first case relates to our first objective to be able to explain the difference between the triple aim and the quadruple aim. Um, so we have a case, and then there's a couple follow-up questions following the case. So I'll go ahead and read it. Multiple studies have demonstrated that distance to care is the largest barrier for patients obtaining medical care for cardiac emergencies in a rural county. Current lengthy distance to care leads to increased travel times, extra out-of-pocket health care costs, and less optimal cardiac outcomes in this patient population. A large hospital's cardiac care department is setting up five satellite clinics that are located strategically throughout the county to provide emergency and preventive services. Each cardiologist will see patients one day per week at these new clinics. This endeavor is also expected to lower healthcare costs for individual patients. So the first question is, which of the following are defining characteristics of the quadruple aim of healthcare? A, improved health of the population, reduced healthcare costs, enhanced patient experience, prevention of physician burnout. B, performance-based physician reimbursement, continuous quality improvement, prevention of physician burnout. C, increased funding for healthcare research, reduced healthcare costs, performance-based reimbursement. Or D, improvements in medical education, development of ACOs, prevention of physician burnout. So the answer to this question, the defining characteristics of the quadruple aim of healthcare is A, improved health of the population, reduced healthcare costs, enhanced patient experience, and prevention of physician burnout. And so where does this uh, quadruple aim then come from, Dr. Mann? 
Yeah, so the, the quadruple aim is really an extension of what was first introduced by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the triple aim of, um, of healthcare. And that was focused on really ensuring that the patient's care experience includes improving the health of patient, you know, a population of patients and really reducing the costs of healthcare while achieving, uh, achieving high value healthcare while considering um, you know, while considering the entire patient care experience, so that was the that was the triple aim. The quadruple aim really was the addition of probably the most important component of that is considering the uh, the work life quality of our healthcare providers. Because without taking that into consideration, you know, we could have the best healthcare system in the world that provides the highest quality, highest value care, but if we have providers. Uh, that are exhausted and are burnt out and who themselves are not engaged in their environment, then it would be very difficult to provide that optimal patient care experience. Let me ask then, uh, you being an OBGYN, yes. we, uh, <laughs> my residency was a little bit tough, I would say. Um, I bet yours was a little bit more. <laughs> Have you experienced times in your life where uh, you've been um, affected by burnout? You know, that, that is a great question. And I will tell you, it actually happened uh, during the end of my residency. So these were back, as you alluded to, this was back in the time when we were, uh, there were no specific restrictions on work hours. You know, we were uh, working about 130 hours a week, you know, the old 36 hour uh, days on and, you know, a couple hours off to go home and, and, and then come back and do the same thing. And, you know, when I reflect how things were then and, and how things are now. You know, I've been doing this for about 30 years and I can honestly say that I love it, that I really, even though, you know, times are stressful and, and we get exhausted. The difference is, is that, you know, finding that passion and engagement are, are there and they're, they really are renewed every day. And I think the reason for that is, is one, the, um, we're not working, you know, we're not working those it, the insane hours that we used to. But I also think it's about, about finding what about medicine you really love. I mean, we all love taking care of patients. And then for some, that that's their focus. Some people enjoy patient care and maybe another component of medicine. And that's what reduces the burnout. It's, it's really being able to take a deep dive into, into what you love doing and balancing that with your life outside of, uh, of the hospital. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned that, uh, you know, we have these these four uh, components of the quadruple aim, uh, Angie, the improved health of the population, reduced health care costs, third, enhanced patient experience, and fourth, uh, prevention of physician burnout. Uh, the follow-up question upon this case was, from a public health perspective, which of the following describe, best describes the primary goal of this new endeavor? Um and we've got choice A was increased patient referrals to the hospital, B, increased patient outreach by the hospital, C, improvement of the health of the population, and D, improvement in cardiac medical education. So can you walk us through what the correct answer is there? Or? Okay. Um, so the correct answer to this question is C, improvement of the health of the population. So Dr. Mann, if you want to expand. You know, I think the um, the takeaway point from from this case scenario is really understanding that how the provision of a you know the emergent and, and preventive cardiac services through these different clinics is an optimal is a way to allow a patient population access to healthcare. So, when you look at the different uh, when the other the other options for this question, it is certainly possible that by you know providing satellite clinics, certainly going to, you know, increase patient referrals to the hospital. There'll be an increase in patient outreach, and it might even benefit medical education. But from a public health standpoint, and from a population perspective, it's about access, and it's about improving the health of a population. Because if, if, if patients cannot get the services that they need, then that's not going to. That is. Uh, that's that's something that's going to be disadvantageous for the population as a whole in whatever setting we're talking about. So, in a small rural county, the idea is to make access possible for patients instead of having them drive to you know the the uh, the city or to the mothership, so to speak, the main hospital. By having those services available to the patients is how we're going to ultimately improve the health of a population. Healthy patients, healthy populations, and 
better for the community as a whole. So what are some of the initiatives that, uh, you know, systems take to increase access? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, in addition to actually having, you know, physical locations for patients to go that are closer to their home, there are other ways to, to look at a system and connect patients with the care that they need. And one of this is certainly telehealth. And I think that what we have found, especially with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, is we have thought of more innovative and creative ways to connect with our patients. And certainly there are many specialties that have already been doing this, but I think what we've seen now is that telehealth has become much more widespread. Specialties that had never considered connecting with patients that way are now doing that. So um, we talked about our quadruple aim. Angie, uh, what's next up in our learning objectives for today? So our next case, again, with a couple follow-up questions, touches on quite a few of our learning objectives. Um, those are to explain the difference between the triple aim and the quadruple aim, define systems thinking, and explain the importance of systems thinking to patient care, and explain how provider burnout is related to healthcare outcomes. So our case reads, a 36-year-old plastic surgeon has just joined a new healthcare organization as a practicing physician. Per her contract, the physician is expected to dedicate 80% of her time to clinical services and 20% to research. However, due to the current paucity of plastic surgeons in the organization, she is constantly overbooked for procedures and ends up spending nearly all of her time engaged in clinical activities, leaving little or no time for research during the week. She works on her research projects over the weekends. So our first question is, which of the following would have been affected the most if the physician had not been able to adjust the extra clinical workload in her schedule? Um, answer choices are A, patient-physician interaction, B, operational capacity of the organization, C, operational effectiveness of the organization, D, quality of patient care, or E, healthcare costs of plastic surgery procedures. So the answer to this one would be B, operational capacity of the organization. Well, that's interesting because I'm tempted to answer uh, a few of these. So Dr. Mann, tell me why uh, B is the correct one here. Yeah, no, Patrick, you, uh, you're absolutely right. Certainly, certainly indirectly, uh, the other choices can be impacted. But what we're really looking at here is, again, kind of thinking from a systems perspective. So we have a, a physician who has the ability to take care of patients and is being asked to increase her productivity with respect to seeing patients. And so when we think about the operational, this is really an example of the operational capacity of an organization. So in other words, it's the amount or quantity of services that, a, uh, that an organization is able to provide. And in, in this particular context, we're looking at the ability of patients you know, who need plastic surgery services or care to be seen by a patient. There is no question that indirectly things like the patient-physician interaction can be impacted. Uh, the quality of care can be impacted if she, um, if she is exhausted or if she's really being overworked. And it's unlikely that healthcare costs are going to be directly impacted. But what we're really looking at her here is how is the ability of a, of a specific resource within the system, and, and let's face it, our physicians are resources within the system to, to provide a certain quantity of services. So that's what the capacity, the operational capacity is. Now that's different than the operational effectiveness. The operational effectiveness is really refers to how an organization utilizes its resources. So how efficiently those resources are utilized, how those resources are made available to the, uh, to the people in need. So that's a little different than the, the specific ability of a provider to be able to see a certain number of patients. So to give an extreme example, to draw out this distinction, so mm -hmm. something that would affect the operational effectiveness of the organization may be um, for our specialty in, in OBGYN, uh, if between patients, the physician had to walk uh, to the other side of the office building, which took a minute every time to get exactly. a speculum, for instance, that would Perfect. affect the effectiveness of the organization and probably increase burnout too, because that would drive me. 
<laughs> right. And it would definitely, you know, if you have to, if you have to go to a different location in the office to get a speculum, it's not, you know, it's not immediately available. That's going to certainly indirectly impact the interaction that you have with your patient because your patient has to wait. But when you really talk about your ability to see patients, you're going to be able, you're not going to be able to see as many patients because there's not the lacking the efficiency of the availability of those resources. Yeah. And uh, if only uh, <laughs> most problems were so easy to solve. Um, <laughs> but All right. Angie, what is the follow-up uh, next kind of question that this case uh, asks us to consider? Um, so it's it reads, if this pattern of work overload persists continuously, which of the following may have the most significant impact on patient care? Uh, answer choices are A, increased physician stress, B, increased patient wait time, C, medical errors, D, increasing healthcare costs to patients, or E, reduced patient-physician interaction. Um, so this was one, again, where many of the answer choices seem tempting. Um, in this case, the correct answer is C, medical errors. Um, so kind of going off of what Dr. Mann mentioned with the previous question, um, a lot of these other factors can indirectly impact patient care. So you know, increased physician stress and increased patient wait time, those things can have an indirect impact on patient care. Um, but we do know that work overload is directly related to an increased likelihood of making medical errors, which would be the most significant consequence in this situation on patient care. Yeah. And I, I think this this one's good, too, because uh, I think that it gets to the ethics of things because I'm um, sure. I mean, we're looking at single best answer questions for standardized exams within medical education. But uh, what is the outcome primarily? What is the thing that we try to do properly as a physician, as a medical act? And it's it's to, you know, do good for the patient um, and then first up, do no harm primum non notare. And so all of these things that are mentioned, sure, could have um, an impact on patient care, but the most significant one that goes to the very nature of what we do as doctors is an impact on, you know, good care, an impact on doing good for the patient, and a medical error, which is a harm in some sense to patients. So uh, Dr. Mann, walk us through a little more in detail, though, these uh, answer choices, why medical errors are most significantly impacted by physician burnout, I guess, or overwork, I guess you could summarize. Yeah. Well, I think just to follow up on what Angie said, you know, this, this question really is kind of that classic scenario that we know exists and is and it's an example of why the AAA was really expanded to improve the fourth goal of, in, of ensuring that we consider the work life of healthcare providers. Um, we know that physicians who are overburdened for long periods of time uh, are at increased risk for fatigue and medical errors. And that is the number one uh, adverse outcome associated with uh, physician burnout and, and physician exhaustion. And you know, to your to your point, Patrick, yes, there's there's no question that there may be other secondary effects of those patients may have to wait longer. Uh, it's possible that there could be extra healthcare costs, but at the end of the day, as healthcare providers and as physicians, we are here to provide the best possible care for our patients. And as you said, to do no harm. And so when we have fatigued, exhausted, burnt out physicians, the first thing that to happen are those mistakes, the medical errors that we see. And we know that physicians who are healthcare providers who are not exhausted, who are engaged, um, are less likely to make mistakes and less likely to make errors. Perfect. So uh, good. Let's move on then to our, our next case here, Angie. Okay, so the learning objectives that are touched on with this case are to explain the importance of systems thinking to patient care and define the Donabedian model of care quality. Um, over a five-year period, a hospital has added 24-7 specialty coverage for orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, anesthesiology, emergency medicine, radiology, obstetrics, and critical care. The hospital also implemented a quality assessment program to monitor performance metrics, including the duration of stay in the emergency department prior to definitive treatment, 
in hospital length of stay, complications, unplanned 30 day readmissions, and overall mortality. With the implementation of a hospital wide electronic health record and digital data entry, the wait time in the ED was decreased from 85 to 45 minutes. 30-day readmission rate decreased from 8.9 to 5.4%, and the overall mortality rate was reduced from 6.6 to 4.3%. Which of the following best describes the framework for improvements in healthcare delivery as outlined above? A, industrial quality management model. B, Donabedian model for care quality. C, quality assurance model. Or D, pay for performance mode. So the answer to this one would be B, Donabedian model for care quality. Okay. Dr. Mann, you're up. So I I love this question because it's really a a great example of a systems thinking approach to quality improvement. And the Donabedian model of healthcare quality is, is is a framework that's based on three components. So it looks at structure, at processes, and at outcomes. And really, this is a comprehensive quality improvement approach that uh, is impl- can be implemented by a hospital or a system. And in this particular question, this hospital has done just that. They've looked at all the different services that are available, and they're looking at structure, at processes, and at outcomes. And I think what's important about this model is that really it is a broader, comprehensive framework that can be used to assess quality improvement efforts in healthcare. And it really, what I love about it is that it links kind of the operational design, if you will, of the healthcare quality uh, system focus on structure and processes, and patient health outcomes. So that's really what the the Donabedian model uh, for care quality is about. It's a comprehensive uh, systems-based approach that looks at how the entire system functions to ensure that every aspect of how the organization functions is done with the highest quality possible. So when you look at these other choices, the in, now the industrial quality management model is really more focused on how to streamline the delivery of healthcare services. So it's really just focused on the process of healthcare delivery. Um, the uh, the quality assurance model is more focused again on healthcare services, but it's not looking at the entire model. It's not looking at the patient population. It's not looking about how patients are directly impacted and how patients receive high quality health care. And then the uh, the last model, the pay for performance uh, pay for performance model is really more about incentivizing uh, providers to you know to be uh, clinically effective and it it promotes uh, a minimum uh, set of requirements of you for the quality of healthcare delivery. But again it does take into consideration how the entire system functions to provide the best highest quality health care within the context of a health care system and the community that it serves. And just a question regarding that. Can you give an example? Um, you, you defined the industrial quality management model focused on how to streamline, how to streamline the delivery of health care services. What would be an example of uh, delivering health care services? So, for, for example, if you've got um, if you have a outpatient clinic that's looking at at how to decrease wait time. So if you were just focused on that component of healthcare, and let's say that the the office had figured out a way to decrease the amount of time that patients have to wait from 20 minutes to 15 minutes, but it just looked specifically at uh, how the providers function without thinking about the impact, you know, what other factors might impact patients getting to the office, maybe there's more to patients waiting than just how the providers are functioning, but thinking about how the patient is impacted, thinking about the factors that impact the patient accessing, getting, accessing the services, getting to the office, and then what happens afterwards. So it's just very focused on a process. It's not looking at the available resources, how they're utilized, and it's not looking at the outcome that's associated with that change. So we can certainly say, yes, Wait time was decreased by five minutes, but how did that impact the patient? How did that impact the providers? Yeah, and uh, some of the assumptions we make, of course, would be that uh, 
wait time is always bad, but I don't know that that's inherent to uh, wait time itself. Because what if you had um, looked at your uh, clinic workflows and found that you know your your doctor is seeing thirty patients in a day, but they have so many problems that half of them need to make a second follow up appointment that generates you know another uh, fifteen minute visit or something, whereas if you gave them some form to fill out and answer questions, you might be able to um, take care of two problems the patient has in a total time of 20 minutes or something of that nature. Um, but something like the industrial quality management model uh, applied to this outpatient hypothetical office uh might be to look at how wait times um, are a, a, a an indicator of um, poor performance and then just have somebody go tell the doctor to speed up the documentation and order placement um, to put it very crassly. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, right. Without thinking, just as you alluded to, with, without taking into consideration what potentially, is there something else that could be done during that time that the patient is waiting? Is there some other a service that could be offered to the patient. You know, what would the what could the patients utilize? What would be most beneficial? And, and as an example, in in our line of work, when we have, you know, if we have a patient waiting in the office, maybe it would be helpful for that patient to see a video, you know, on uh, prenatal care or here's what to expect in your third, you know, in your third trimester, things like that. So, it's very focused on just the process without thinking about what impacts the process and. What, how, how you can look instead of just focusing on the process itself, how you can look at how the entire system may actually be able to function better if that process were, um, were changed, but not just looking at it for the, the quantitative perspective of it. Absolutely. All right, Angie, um, the follow-up question for this one um, gets into, you know, more of a, a practical uh, question about what is an outcome, you know, so what do, what do we have here? Yeah, so the same hospital decided to assess the quality of obstetrics delivered within their system, which of the following would exemplify an outcome as described by the Donabedian model. So we have A, the number of board-certified obstetricians, B, availability of blood for transfusions, C, the quality of handoffs when patients are signed out to the on-call team, or D, the change in patient satisfaction over the five-year period. So the correct answer for this one would be D, the change in patient satisfaction over the five-year period. So outcomes, Dr. Mann, are not just, you know, how, how many patients can we see for the lowest amount of money or how many postpartum hemorrhages can we avoid? Um, but there's more to it than that. Another leading question. Yeah, yeah so when, when, we, when you think about the Donabedian model, so the outcomes that we're focused on are directly, outcomes that are directly result from the quality of the system, the quality of care that the system is set up to provide. And when we think about the system as, what, what really is so unique about this model is that it looks at all the components that impact the outcomes that we're trying to improve. So it looks, so for example, with choices A and B, although they're very important, these are not outcomes. These are some of the resources that provide the structure of the system. So that the number of board certified obstetricians that are available to see patients or the availability of blood for transfusions, these are important resources that support the structure of the system that we're taking that we're taking that 30,000 foot view of and trying to understand how you know the quality of the care that we're providing for patients and then when you look at the quality choice C the quality of handoffs when patients are signed out to the on-call team extremely important that's a process so that's how we make sure that the the different providers within the system communicate so that we know that nothing is lost when patient, you know, during sign outs or when patients are handed off. But again, that's not an outcome. One, an outcome that can result from having the right structure and you know, the right processes in place would be something like a change in patient satisfaction over a five year period. So it's not just about being able to quantitate um, a, specific, uh, a specific metric, but it's really a metric that is going to be connected to the structure and processes that are in place to ensure that what we're doing is the best possible 
care for the patient. So, so another example, if we were to look at, at blood transfusions, so it's not so much about the availability of blood for transfusions, but let's say the, the number of postpartum hemorrhages that occurred or uh, the reduction in response time to providing, to getting a to getting blood to patients who needed transfusions. That would be a system-based outcome that could really impact the quality of care that a patient receives. Cool. Well, I think we have one uh, uh, one more case left, and we have time to discuss it. So, uh, Angie, uh, you want to take this uh, case, which I think is one of the more interesting and more important ones that we could present today. Sure. So this one is kind of continuation of a case that we discussed earlier with the the plastic surgeon who was experiencing kind of the work overload aspect of things. So, so this one focuses on the learning objectives to explain the difference between the triple aim and the quadruple aim, to define systems thinking, and to explain how provider burnout is related to healthcare outcomes. At her quarterly performance evaluation meeting with her boss, the physician is told to pick up the slack, adjust to the way things are, and that her clinical results aren't that great despite excellent patient reported outcomes. Her request for more personnel or physician partners support to balance the clinical workload is not met. This continues for six months, at which point the physician feels fatigue that does not respond to adequate rest. She feels emotionally exhausted and helpless and is increasingly cynical. She no longer feels the motivation to go to work and feels that her work constantly lacks meaning. What is this physician currently experiencing? A, adjustment disorder, B, physician exhaustion, C, physician burnout, or D, major depressive disorder. You know, going back to what we were discussing earlier, the answer to this question is C, physician physician burnout. All right. Dr. Mann, what, what's the difference between physician burnout and uh, I would say especially the other attractive distractors, adjustment disorder and major depressive disorder? You know, I, I think what's so important about this, Patrick, is that it highlights how many times we don't recognize what really are classic signs and symptoms of uh, physician burnout, the, the feeling like I haven't accomplished enough, the the more cynical approach to care, the kind of like, oh, uh, you know, nobody really cares about what I'm doing. And and just what the question that that I that I'm gonna speculate that we have all asked at some point is like, why am I even here? You know, I'm not making a difference. Why am I here? And these this is very different than some of the other mental health issues that we're seeing that can certainly result from physician burnout. But what I think is really important is that if we can, if physician burnout is recognized in the beginning stages, that a lot of times the the exhaustion or the depression that can go along with that can absolutely be avoided. You know, so physician burnout is really the beginning stage that can lead to so many of the uh, mental health issues that physicians experience. And that's not, you know, that's not a, a judgment. That, that's just a fact. And if there were some way that we could start from the beginning to figure out how to really provide the resources that we all need to provide the best the patient care that we want to provide, uh, that in of itself would eliminate uh, a lot of the um, factors that contribute to burnout. Because at the end of the day, I think if you ask uh, most physicians, we all do this because we want to make sure that our patients receive the best care possible. And so when we feel that that's no longer, that the system does not support that and that that is no longer within our control, no matter what we do, that's what leads to this sense of what's the point? I'm not making a difference. Why don't, you know, why do I even try? And this is very different than an adjustment disorder. You know, an adjustment disorder is a temporary response to a temporary situation. When we're talking about burnout, we're talking about an ongoing situation that does not remit, that just continues. The, the lack, as we're seeing in this question, the lack of resources, the lack of infrastructure, the lack of support that can really contribute to this, this uh, sense of, you know, why am I here? I'm not making a difference. Nothing is changing. Yeah, I, I will say too. I, I certainly have uh, have experienced burnout as a physician. That that um, 
you know, I guess that's what you would call it too. I, I've had uh, some depression as well. I think the uh, that's come out uh, throughout the the years I've done this podcast, and I feel comfortable saying that now. Um, probably tell this story at some point in more expansive detail um, because I've I've done so well by prioritizing my own mental well-being. But just a reminder too, although it is by no means the, um, you know, cure-all um, or even very, very effective, our mobile application, you guys should download it. We do have some mindfulness meditations in there that are designed specifically for uh, medical students just to help build some of that resilience, hopefully, and uh, provide a, another tool to address some of the things that can affect your mood. But again, I'm not saying this is the, uh, you know, cure for burnout, the cure for depression, just a, another tool uh, that uh, we use to encourage people. But anything else on that, Dr. Mann, or should we take this kind of follow, final follow-up question related to this case? Final follow-up question would be a good place to go. All right, let's do it. Angie, you're up. Which of the following measures by the healthcare organization could have potentially prevented burnout in this physician? Um, Our answer choices are A, provision of regular counseling services, B, better ergonomic design of the workplace, C, better resource allocation, or D, better environmental design of the facility. So the answer for this one would be C, better resource allocation. You know, it's it's so interesting. Um, Certainly look when you look at the uh, different choices. Choice of you know, the provision of counseling services, the ergonomic design of the workplace, and the environmental design of the facility really are not the are not the core issue that leads to burnout. What leads to burnout is feeling is that lack of feeling that lack of control, that lack of ability to provide the best care, the the lack of resources to do so. And so, when you look at all of this counseling, the design of the workplace, the design of the facility are really sidestepping what the major issue is. It's the support that is available for healthcare providers to provide the best care possible. So resource allocation. And I think that there's no question that, you know, this this is always a challenge that organizations face. And it always seems to be the first thing that organizations, you know, healthcare systems think about which, you know, which providers do we not need? You know, how can we, how can we streamline the uh, this the um, resources that are in place to provide optimal patient care. And so this is another example of where that systems thinking approach to looking at the resources with respect to providers and all the, and the team that helps all of us take care of patients is really critical. So it's not, it's not about taking away, but it's about optimizing and really providing the infrastructural support that we need to take care of patients. Counseling, the type of chairs we sit in, that that's not what's going to reduce burnout. I think uh, a good example in my own career would be uh, when I was in the Air Force, uh, and I'm told that, that the EMR is different now, but they used an outpatient EMR called Alta. Mm-hmm. That no joke, it would it would crash once or twice a day, um, and in the course of that, you would lose all of the documentation, and that is so incredibly frustrating. Um, so I went to a workaround solution, which was basically to type out notes in like a Word document and paste them, which is not very efficient, and is a little bit frustrating. So um, it, it hopefully the um, the military has uh, remedied that with a new EMR. I'm, I'm told that that's at least in the works, but, um, you know, optimal resources would adequate, um, you know, uh, tools adequate to the tasks um, that we have are, are definitely important. But um, if there's nothing else, uh, thank you so much for your time and, uh, you know, enjoy Toledo up there. I'm in Cleveland, so, you know, things are not much different from an environment standpoint right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patrick, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. This is you. You really made this a a very uh, a very pleasant experience. We really had a great time. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. And I did not know, by the way, I did not know you were a Toledo alum. I did not realize that. I know. I figured <laughs> that. Uh, I wanted to uh, throw that out there. I was pretty excited to talk to you guys. That's awesome. All right, I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Patrick.